So <clears throat> what we're going to do today is we're going to pick up where you left off in the current homework assignment where we did the first half of the ABI valuation model. So in class today, we will complete the Anheuser-Busch InBev valuation model. We will then do two quick valuations in class. We'll do something called the as-is, and then we'll do the target or final valuation. Okay. Now, <clears throat> generally, we actually want to do four models, but we're only going to have time to do two of them today. Okay. And so as a best practice, the as-is <clears throat> model, which is what we're building to, basically says, given the current share price today, what are the assumptions on a cash flow basis that create the current share price of the company? That's called the as-is. Okay. Then what we're going to do is we're going to do what's called a bull and a bear. So over the next 12 months, if everything goes right for the company we're valuing, what's the best the share price could be? Bull scenario. If everything goes wrong for the company, what's the worst the share price could probably be over the next 12 months? That's the bear scenario. So we establish a range. And then we have our target, which is where we think they're going to be in the range. And that target price versus the current share price is the buy, sell, hold. All right, we're then 10% of the current share price, we'll call it a hold. If our target is more than 10%, we'll call it a buy. And if our target is less than 10%, or less than 90% of the current share price, we'll call it a sell. Okay? And that's basically how we're going to do this. So generally for assignments, for your group projects coming up, you do all four models, four Excel files. But for purposes of today and next week's assignment, you're only going to do two models. Okay? So what's going to happen is in class today, we're going to do ABI embed. Right? And we'll do a target, and we'll, uh, sorry, and we'll do an as is. But for next Monday, you're also going to do the same process for Heineken. Okay? So that is your assignment, to do a valuation of Heineken as is in target. Right? And then who went today? Teams 11 and 12? 10 and 11. 11. Where's 12? Okay. You guys have AMBEV for next Monday as well, as a group. Okay? So team 12 or next team on your list, we'll do AMBEV, and then everybody will do Heineken. So by next Monday, we'll have three companies to compare, ABI, AMBEV, and Heineken in the valuation models, right? So today, what I want to do is I want to complete the model. So I am not going to post this Excel file. So I think the only way, if I gave you this file, you'd have no idea how the model works. So the only way you're going to know how the model works is if you finish creating it itself. So I'm going to record this on video. I'll post it on YouTube. But nonetheless, you must follow along and finish up the valuation model that you started part one to do part two. So I'm going to pick up where we left off with that Excel file. All right. So <clears throat> just again, a reminder of what we have done so far. So we have built a model that starts out with the model data from Bloomberg, just rows of 80 financial pieces of data for six historical years. And then from this, I created a standardized income statement and balance sheet of historical data for the companies. That's in the income and balance sheet tab. We then created TFI, TII, CFI, so we economically converted all of those historical financial statements. We then used the ratios tab to create, easier if I shrink this, to basically create a forecast of the company going through 2022. Okay, so we forecasted out six years of historic of forecasted data using forecasted ratios. All right, the first five years being the defined period, year six being the first year of continuing value. And then we created forecasted financial statements, income statement and balance sheets from those forecasted ratios, which then created forecasted primarily CFIs and the forecasted cash flows. All right, that's what we have done so far. Right? So here's where we're going to pick up. Based on these forecasted cash flows, we want to do an enterprise DCF valuation of the company. So this is in the book. All right? So I'm not going to cover what's in the reading, but we're going to create the enterprise DCF valuation tab. So we're going to go to our last tab in our model. We're going to add a new tab at the end. So I want to put it at the end. And I'm going to name this sheet DCF for discounted cash flow valuation. All right, following Medigliani Miller. Make this a little bit bigger, it's easier to see. Now, in the previous tabs, <clears throat> when we built the model, we built everything across the columns. Here, I'm going to go down the rows just so I can print it out on one 8 by 10 sheet, 8 and a half by 11 sheet of paper. Okay, so here's the idea. First, Medigliani Miller, we do the operating value of the firm. Okay, 
So the operating value is the expected free cash flows. So starting in cell B1, these are the forecasted free cash flows that are in our model. Off the CFI, starting in 2017, which is the for first forecast year. So cell A2 equals from the CFI 2017, and I'll just do an equal previous year plus one, and I'll go through 2021 in this case. So I have the first five years of free cash flow, and those are going to come directly off of our CFI tab. <clears throat> so our forecast for 2017 free cash flow for cell B2 equals off the CFI tab. 2017 free cash flow is row 12, so it'll be H12. 2018 free cash flow off the CFI tab will be I12. 2019 forecasted free cash flow off the CFI tab will be J12. 2020 off the CFI tab will be K12 and 2021 off the CFI tab for forecast for free cash flow will be L12. So those are the first five years. I'll format these. Those are the first five years of free cash flow that are currently being forecasted by the model. Okay? So we want to present value those. So I want to discount those based on the WAC. Right? So what I'll do is I'll create some discount factors. Discount factor is 1 divided by 1 plus R. So in this case, it's 1 divided by 1 plus the WAC. The WAC is on the Assumptions tab. And right now, it is cell B4. Let's go back. What did I do wrong here? Oh, thank you. No equal sign. Equals 1 divided by 1 plus from the Assumptions tab before. Now, I'm about to copy and paste this down. <clears throat> so what I want to do is I want to make this an absolute reference to B4, dollar sign B, dollar sign 4. And I want to copy and paste this down through the five years. So first year, 2017, is 1 divided by 1 plus R. Second year, 1 divided by 1 plus R squared. Third year, 1 plus r to the third power, fourth year 1 plus r to the fourth power, and 1 plus r to the fifth power. So that my discounted free cash flows, present value, is the free cash flow times the discount factor. So that is for the first five years the present value of the free cash flows for each of those years. Okay? So, if I add those up, I get the operating value for the first five years. So, if our assumptions come true, <clears throat> then the operating value is about $30 billion in present value today. That's how much value they'll generate in the first five years. Right? But a company lasts more than five years. So the assumption is companies last forever. So we need what's called a continuing value period. So the continuing value period is starting in 2022, what the book calls N plus 1 or T plus 1. That's why you always forecast one additional year, because that extra year, in this case 2022, is the beginning of the continuing value period. Okay? So... <clears throat> the continuing value formula is the key value driver equation out of the book. Okay? It's the modified growing perpetuity equation. So what I want to do is I want to put that formula into cell B9. Okay? Except what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this on the assumptions tab. And there are four parts of the key value driver formula. One is the WAC. Two is the continuing value no plat or the expected no plat in the continuing value period. I need a continuing value ROIC, which is also called the RONIC, return on the new incremental capital in the continuing value period. 
and I need my continuing value G. Those are the four things with the WAC that create, so I'll make these yellow, that create the key value driver equation. All right, so we already have a WAC on here, so I want the next three. So my continuing value no plat as a starting point is going to be my 2022 no plat. So on my TII, we have a forecast for no plat. First period of the continuing value is 2022. So M4 off the TII. All right? That is the first period of the no plats. All right? Next, I need a continuing value ROIC equals off of the EP EOI tab. It is my ROIC, return invested capital after goodwill, so row 15, and 2022 would be M15. That is my RONIC. That is my continuing value ROIC. We're using 2022 as the first year of the continuing value period. Right? And then finally, I need a G. As a placeholder, I'm going to put in 3%. Right? And that's just arbitrary. But the general idea is most U.S. European companies are going to grow at about 3% long term. So therefore, we're going to start with a G that you grow with the economy. Again, we can adjust that up or down later. But right now, we'll put as a placeholder 3%. So given these four placeholders, I want to go back to my DCF tab. As a matter of fact, I might want to save my model along the way just in case. I have a problem with Excel and it comes crashing down. I hate to lose everything. So I'll go back to my DCF tab. And in cell B9, I want to put in the key value driver formula. So equals left paren off of the assumptions tab, continuing value no plat times left paren 1 minus The continuing value growth divided by the continuing value ROIC, right paren, right paren, divided by left paren, continuing value WAC, minus continuing value G. So, a little over $60 billion. $60 billion, $63 million and change. <clears throat> so again, that's the formula for key value drivers. I'm just basically putting it in to here. No plat times 1 minus G over ROIC, all of that divided by WAC minus G. Okay, so I'm just using the data from the model to create that. All right. So once we have that formula, <clears throat> that is the value as of the beginning of 2022. So I need to present value that today. Now built into the growing perpetuity, it actually discounts the current year. So I don't want to double discount the current year of 2022. It's a common mistake people make. So what I need to do is I need to basically use the same discount factor as 2021, and I want to bring this back to the present. So for ABI right now, the model saying 30 billion of cash operating value, free cash flow value for the first five years, and another 37.8 billion of free cash flow value, six into perpetuity. Right? That's what we quickly forecasted. So that if I sum this up, the total operating value of ABI is the sum of the two. It's the 30 billion for the first five years plus the 37.8 billion in perpetuity. So basically we're forecasting an operating value of 68 billion 27.76 million. Okay. Following Modigliani Miller. Operating plus non-operating equals enterprise value. Here is where TFI helps us, okay? Because in TFI, we listed the non-operating assets and liabilities. There are three. Excess cash, non-operating assets, net of non-operating liabilities, long-term investments and receivables. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull those directly from the TFI. Here's the other thing. We're going to list those in present value which means the last reported numbers from the company. So in this case, we're going to use the 2016 results for the three. So row nine, 2016 is G. So we're going to use G9, 10, and 11 for those three numbers. Here's the idea. This is the non-operating assets the company has today. 
we're going to assume that a company is not good at non-operating assets in the future. So therefore, any new non-operating assets and liabilities will be NPV zero. Okay. So basically, the only value of the non-operating business is the value they have today. Right. This is a standard assumption that we're going to make. Okay. So that if we take the operating value plus the non-operating value, when we sum that up, we get the enterprise value forecast for the firm. So the operating value plus the sum of these non-operating assets and liabilities. So 68 billion 167 of enterprise value. Right? Now the one adjustment that we may choose to make in the future is these long-term investments. Okay? So <clears throat> for example, a few years ago, Yahoo won the lottery when Yahoo bought a piece of Alibaba early on before Alibaba went public. It's a non-operating investment. So the thing is, on Yahoo's balance sheet, as they've been trying to sell and spin this off, the actual value was the book value of what they paid. It's not representative of the real true value of what Alibaba is, because now that they're a public company, we know what 30% of that public value is. It's far higher than what was on the balance sheet. So what we're going to do is we're going to put in an adjustment factor for this book value of long-term investments, just in case we have this situation pop up with another company. And what we're going to do is on the assumptions tab, we're going to have something called the price to book multiple of long-term investments. And we're going to make this a yellow cell and we're going to start it out at a one, price to book of one, which means trades at book value. And here's the idea that I'm going to take this price to book multiple and I'm going to multiply it by the long-term investments so that if I have a company like a Yahoo, which had, had a much bigger non-operating asset that its book value represents, and I knew it was trading at, for example, 10 times book value, then I could take the long-term investments and I can multiply it by the price to book multiple, and that would adjust it to a more reasonable market value. Right? But if I don't know what it is, then at least I'll have the book value on here. Okay? So that's why I'll leave it at 1 as a starting point. Okay? All right. So very quickly, we have forecasted the enterprise value for Anheuser-Busch InBev. Now here's the other side of, of enterprise value. Debt and equity equals enterprise value. Right? So here's enterprise DCF. If we pay off all of the debt and all of the non-common equity holders, what's left, the residual goes to the common shareholders. So again, this is where TFI helps us, right? Because we have listed on TFI the debt and equity that has to be paid. The retirement related liabilities, the interest bearing debt, we're solving for common equity, so we don't pay that off. <clears throat> the preferred shareholders and the minority shareholders, minority interest. So those are the four non-common liabilities and equity that have to be paid off before the shareholders get their money, the common shareholders. Again, we're going to use what's owed now, 2016 actually reported data. So equals off the TFI. 2016 is G, so for retirement, row 14, G14. Interest bearing debt off of TFI, G15. <clears throat> Preferred shareholders equals 17, G17. And minority shareholders, G18, off of the TFI. So that is what is owed today <clears throat> in present value to each of these four stakeholders to pay them off. Let's format this two decimal places. So my common equity value is a residual. So it's the enterprise value minus the sum of these four things, right? which right now happens to be negative. <clears throat> to get a share price, I need a share is outstanding. Now again, best practice, I don't want to start putting assumptions throughout my model. So in the assumptions tab, shares outstanding. 
that is an assumption, which I will find in Bloomberg. If I go to ABI, <clears throat> it's on the DES screen. On the description of a company is the current shares outstanding. <coughs> so we'll use that number. It's easy to find. Okay. So right now, 2 billion, 19.2 million. 2019.2. Yes. I have a question um, back on the DCF tab. Mm -hmm. Which um, I'm on that tab. Next. Um, the I, I don't understand why if you scroll up a little bit. You well, the shares outstanding. Let me just do this. Shares outstanding equals and the assumptions. All right. You don't understand what? I don't understand why you include non-operating assets less non-operating liabilities mm -hmm. in the um, enterprise value calculation because. For the free cash flow that you're using to get to the total operating, operating value, value. Um, that has the operating liabilities. It doesn't have the non-operating liabilities. Oh, so that that free okay. <clears throat> so the free cash flow is operating assets net of operating liabilities. The non-operating value is the net operating non-operating assets net of non-operating liabilities. Okay. Now there's usually a lot less non-operating liabilities, but we want to make sure that if there are any, we count those in our valuation. So, but good question, right? Other questions or clarification? All right, <clears throat> by the way, if we take that share count of shares outstanding and divide by the common equity value, we basically get a forecasted, forecast good share price. So our forecasted share price is the common equity value divided by shares. So right now, negative $33 a share. We got some placeholder data in here. We're about to adjust it, but nonetheless, that once we get to this point, completes our enterprise DCF valuation model. Right? We now have built a reusable model based on pulling data from Bloomberg. <clears throat> okay, so this is where we all need to get. All right. Once we're at this point, we're ready to start valuation number one, which is Anheuser Busch InBev's as-is valuation. Okay. So here's what we mean by an as-is valuation, right? So right now, and I'll put this on the assumptions tab, the current share price for Anheuser-Busch InBev is 102.40 in euros. So what I need to do is I need to get this model share price to be close to 102.40. <laughs> and right now, it's negative 33. So obviously, we got some changes to make. Okay. So <clears throat> now what we're going to do is we're going to basically go through the model and adjust the model so that we get within $1 or 1 euro of the current share price. So we're going to get very close to the current share price. That's what's called an as-is. Okay? And everyone must do this. Not only for ABI, but your homework assignment next week is to do it for Heineken, and the group is going to do it for AMBEV. Okay? And your group project, you're going to do the same thing. As a matter of fact, over the next month, we're going to do a valuation of class. So every class, you will always do an as is. All right, it's good practice to do this. So here's the idea. We want to replicate as close as we can the current share price by backing into the cash flows that justify that share price. Okay? It's not whether you agree with them. It doesn't matter whether you agree to it or not. This is the actual share price. And intrinsic value says cash flow has the equal price. So we're trying to figure out what the cash flows are to justify that price. That's what we're actually doing. So a couple things. Let's go back to our assumptions tab. First thing we need is we need a current WAC for ABI InBev. So we go to Bloomberg. We type in WAC. And we get a current WAC. And right now their WAC is 7%. Okay. So what I'll do. File, take screenshot, save. So ABI WAC, I will save this so you'll have a copy of what I'm seeing. But their WAC is 7%. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to change this to 7. Now notice that my share price immediately jumps to negative 15. Right, so I'm much closer to being positive share price when I adjust the WAC. 
Okay. Now, to make my life easier, so I'm going to keep jumping to that tab, I'm going to go into the ratios tab, because I'm going to make most of my changes off the ratios in a minute. And I'm going to put in here forecast share price. I'm going to make this a relative reference equals DCF valuation. I'm going to put that number in there as a relative reference. That way I don't keep jumping back and forth across the tabs. Right? And I'm going to put in my current share price, which I'm going to reference off of the assumptions tab. So I need to get to close to 102.40, and right now I'm at negative 15.58, just so I get those numbers to be close together. All right? Questions about what I just did? All right, so <clears throat> four things are going to matter most to your valuation. Okay? First thing <clears throat> that's going to matter is free cash flow. It's key. And these are the three most important drivers of free cash flow. Growth, which is revenue. EBITDA margin, tax rate. Those three things will create your gross cash flow. Here's the fourth point on this page. The other piece of free cash flow is gross investment. This is where tying everything on this operating balance sheet as a percentage of revenue helps us. Because every one of those items is a percentage of revenue. As revenue grows, the balance sheet grows. The difference between the two balance sheets, gross investment. So what we're essentially building in the model is a current level of productivity that stays forward, operating productivity for the business. So assuming the productivity doesn't change too much, then everything grows with revenue and essentially creates our gross investment for us. Now, if we believe that the productivity will change, we can go in and adjust these numbers, but for most companies, it doesn't happen too often. So therefore, that auto forecasts the balance sheet for us, and we focus on these items, and that will create our valuation. So <clears throat> let's talk about what we need to forecast. We'll start with tax rate. I need a reasonable tax rate for ABI and bed, right? So first thing, you always, if you have the chance, ask the company. If you ask a CFO or a treasurer what your tax rate's going to be, they'll tell you, okay? Now, we don't have direct access to them here, but the analysts would know, so we'd probably want to look this up in the analyst reports, right? Because they spiked to 37%, but as the group that presented today said, ABI just did a gigantic acquisition. So that probably screwed up their tax rate for 2016. And it's probably not representative of what their tax rate is going to be going forward. That their tax rate is probably going to be much lower if you look at historical numbers because they do most of their business outside the U.S. and they have, they're not based in the U.S., they're based in Amsterdam. They are actually in a much lower tax rate jurisdictions. So <clears throat> I'm just going to use as a placeholder 20%. And I think that's actually closer to what the analysts will be using for Anheuser-Busch InBev because 2016 is an is a acquisition related anomaly. Okay, it might even be a little lower than that, but we're going to say 20% as a starting point for a model. Okay, so <clears throat> next we need an EBITDA forecast and we need a growth forecast. And here's what I'm telling you: there is no one in this room, including myself, that knows this company better than the sell side analysts as outsiders that are tracking this company for a living. Okay, so this is real world. This class is very real world. So I want a real valuation, which means we can leverage real world data. So here's the thing. Instead of creating our own forecast, why not use the consensus that the sell siders have already put out there as a starting point? So let's go back to Bloomberg and let's go to the EEO screen because on this EEO screen is the consensus estimate for the next four years on an annualized basis in euros. Okay, so here's the deal. Right here is the number of analysts that are forecasting. And what you'll notice is as we get to years three and four, the number of the analysts in the forecast goes down, particularly in year four. Years three and four starts to go down. Here's the thing. Every single analyst that covers ABI MBEF for a living professionally has a model that goes out at least five to ten years. But every time you upload it to Bloomberg, you're tracked. So if you're tracked and you're wrong, you lose your job. So basically... The analysts, even though they'll have forecasts going out, not all of them are willing to put themselves out there and put the forecast, particularly for years three, four, and five, 
into these data services. But they're pretty consistent about doing the first two years. So you can use all the four years, but we're going to at least use the first two years because you'll quickly see that those are the most heavily forecasted but publicly available. And we're going to start with the consensus in our model. So here's the point. Let's go back to this. And instead of creating a growth and an EBITDA margin forecast, go back to those no-fills, I'm going to use the consensus estimates for those. So in our assumptions, so I'm going to add equals current year plus one, and then another year plus one. I want the estimated sales and the estimated EBITDA, EBITDA, that the analysts are actually coming from the consensus estimates. This comes from the EEO. So, in 2017, and again, I'll take a screenshot of this. Screenshot, file, save, ABI EEO. 2017 estimated revenue 56,773 euro. And 2018, 58,939 euro. For EBITDA in 2017, 21,866. And for 2018, 23,532. That is what the analysts are saying today the next two years look like for ABI of them, off of the consensus estimates. Questions about where I got that data? Okay, so I need these numbers to become these numbers for 2017-2018. So again, these aren't yellow cells. I can't directly change the income statement, but I change it through the ratios. So what I need to do is I need to solve for a revenue growth rate that gets me to that revenue number. So the forecast for percentage change is current year minus previous year divided by previous year. So that's what we're going to put in here. So equals left per n current year 2017 is the 2017 EEO assumption for sales. Minus previous year is the 2016 actual reported income revenue divided by 2016 income statement revenue. So that the analysts are predicting a 24.7% growth rate in revenue. Okay. Matter of fact, I can check that. Because if I put in 24.7%, then I get an income number of 56,773, which exactly matches the 56,773 of consensus. So I'm just solving for the revenue growth rate that gets me to that number. All right. I'm going to do that again for 2018. So equals left paren current year. 2018 minus previous year, 2017, divided by previous year, 2017. So what the analysts are predicting is 24.7% growth in 2017, followed by 3.8% growth in 2018. That's what the analysts are actually predicting. Questions? Okay, I need to do the same thing with EBITDA margin. My 2017 expected EBITDA margin equals, from the assumptions tab, 2017 EBITDA euros divided by 2017 sales in euros. They're predicting a 38.5% EBITDA margin. For 2018 equals 2018 EBITDA divided by 2018 sales they're predicting a 39.9% EBITDA margin in 2019. So that's what the analysts are predicting today based on the earnings consensus estimates for ABI inbound. By the way, with those numbers in, we're at a 57.81 share price against 102.40. So I'm much closer to their actual share price now. Questions? Yes? Um, did it turn it's actually in dollars? It says dollars, but this oh, is euros. Okay. Yeah, so I probably should get rid of dollars since we're dealing with non-US companies. I don't know how to make Excel say euros. 
Yeah, these are yours. Okay. All right, good question. Other questions? All right, so now I need a growth rate that's more representative. So here's the thing. When the teams did the homework assignment, they came up with a growth rate of like 9%. Okay. And like I said, in continuing value, the continuing value can't be 9%. But here's what it does tell me is that Anheuser-Busch long-term is probably expected to grow faster than three. Right. And, and the reason why I'd say faster than three is Anheuser-Busch InBev's strategy, which they have said, is to basically buy assets in emerging markets. So they are well positioned in dominant positions in Asia, in Latin America, and in Africa as people consume more beer, that they're gonna consume a lot of ABI beer. And those markets are going much faster for beer consumption than US and Europe. So what you really said, and I think this is a true directional, is that Anheuser-Busch is probably gonna grow much faster than 3% long-term, even long-term, the market's expecting that. So what is that number? <clears throat> We're gonna actually solve this more off the multiples next week. We don't have time to do it today, but that's where the multiples can help us. So we'll go back through the analysis you did today and we'll work through that. But right now, I'm just gonna use 4% as a placeholder. I think it's gonna be closer to four. Call that gut feel. So I'm gonna change my G to 4%, okay? By the way, that gets me to a share price of 65. So I still need to get to 60 to 102. So here's the thing. I'm comfortable with my balance sheet assumptions. I'm comfortable with my tax rate and EBITDA assumptions. So I got to double check my EBITDA assumption after 2018. So here's the thing. Go back to my assumptions. What did we know? We know that if we take our EV to sales and we divide by EV to EBIT, we get our estimated margin. So, for 2018, which is the second forward year, off the multiples for ABI InBev today, <clears throat> we know, and I'll save this again as a file, See, so you can see a copy of this, online that today the EV to sales is 5.82 right now and the EV to EBIT second forward year is 18 So the estimated margin is 32.33%. Okay. Now here's what's interesting. That is this. 32.33. And right now, we're actually saying continuing value 32.4. So <clears throat> basically, within... 0.1%, 10 basis points, of the current margin out of year, the 2018 is what the market thinks ABI is going to do long term. So here's what I would do. I would actually change this to like 39.8. So I've exactly matched it, and that gets me to a share price of 63.84. Okay. But I'm pretty close. I could leave it at 39.9. I don't think 0.1% is going to make a big difference in our valuation. But nonetheless... I would adjust the EBITDA margins to eventually get to this number. Since they're already at that number in 2018, there's not really a lot of adjustment I need to do. But the market is telling me what they're using as a long-term EBITDA margin. Right? And that is how we can back into it. Questions? All right, so <clears throat> last but not least, I need to basically figure out a growth rate that gets me there. It's going to be higher. Based on what the teams did today, probably around 8 or 9%. So let's put in 8%, 96. Let's put in 9%, 104. Let's put in 8.8%, 8 now I'm within 0.2 euros, 
0.14 euros or 0.24 euros, pretty close to the current share price. So this is what I mean by the as is. Whether I agree with their share price or not, irrelevant to this analysis. This is their share price. So to generate the cash flows that justify the share price, here's what I know. At a CVG of about 4%, ABI is looking at growth rate a little under 9, about 40% EBITDA margins at a 20% tax rate. That's what's driving their share price today. Those are pretty close to what the actual people on Wall Street have to be using, assuming that their fair price is justified, the share price is justified. So we've kind of backed into that as our starting point. It isn't whether or not you agree with these assumptions. These are the actual assumptions for being used. Questions? This is called the as is. So save as is. Questions again? All right. What I would next do is I would do a bull. I'll change assumptions to create a very optimistic scenario that I thought is potentially reachable in the next 12 months. I would then create a third file called a bear. And I would put in a very pessimistic scenario of what could go wrong and what could happen in the next 12 months if all hell broke loose. And that would give me a, a range. So I'd communicate to you, here's the share price today. Here's the best I think you could do in 12 months. Here's the worst I think they could do in 12 months. Right now, we're going to skip the bull and the bear for purposes of time. And then we would go to model number four, which is called the target, which is this is the scenario that I believe. Okay? So now I want to create a target. <clears throat> File, save as. And this is what you'll have to do for your homework assignment. So once you do the as is, copy the as is to the target. Spell it right. And then what's very important is you have to give me a fact-based rationale of why you're changing these assumptions to create the target. So a little editorializing. <clears throat> I know everyone that's listening to this video and is in this classroom can plug and chug, right? But your grade is not based on plugging and chugging because you know how to do math, all right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be in this room. What is more important to me is not the math. Don't get me wrong. You get the math wrong, you'll still get no credit. But I know you can do the math. What's important to me is why did you put the number in as opposed to just solving it, okay? That's what I mean by plugging and chugging. So why did you use the growth rate you used? What facts in the real world supported that growth rate? Why did you use the EBITDA margin you used? Why did you use the tax rate you used? Why did you use the G that you used? So for those four assumptions, you have to write it up, okay? So for your homework next week and for your group projects and everything going on, you're going to have to give me your assumptions, and you got to tell me why you use the assumptions. Why did I put in these assumptions? Why do you use 4%? And the data could be very real world. Like, I could go to Bico and Bloomberg, and I can look at what the Bloomberg analysts are saying. I could look at the research reports. I could look at the industry report off of IBIS World. Like, in this class, it's perfectly acceptable to use real world data to help you do this. Don't plagiarize, source. But if you source because, hey, the J.P. Morgan analyst said this, that's perfectly fine. Okay? But nonetheless, this is what you got to do. You got to put in realistic assumptions. You got to defend them. Right? That's how I'm going to grade you in this class. Right? Because, and you can see this with Anheuser Busch and Bev right now. If you go to the ANR, which is the analyst, there is not unanimity about how ABI is going to do in the future. Meaning, perfect timing, Bloomberg kicked off the network. 21 analysts say buy, 14 say hold, 2 say sell. So there's already disagreement in the community as to whether they're buy, sell, or hold, because nobody can predict the future. And so that's the point. It's not whether you say buy or sell as to whether I'm going to give you a perfect grade. It's can you defend your sell? Can you defend your buy? Like, what's your rationale? What's your process for coming up with it? That's what you're going to have to do for Heineken next week. Okay? So here's the point. I go to Bico, Bloomberg Intelligence. Right? I read about the company. I read about the industry. Right? I go to IBIS World. I read about the industry. So I already have a sense of this. I've done the historical analysis right, that we did as part of our homework assignment. So here's the deal. I then come into my model and I say, okay, I actually think, and I'm making this up, but I think that Anheuser Bush InBev is not going to grow at 8% a year long term. I think it's going to be closer to 6 And I think that the markets are going to be much more competitive. And even though they're going to get some good synergies out of this deal long term for the next two years, 
I think longer term, their margins go back closer to 38%, which is where they were historically an EBITDA margin. I think the tax rate is reasonable, but I actually think I'm a little bit more pessimistic on the growth. I'm a little bit more pessimistic on the margins. Oh, by the way, that is a $79 stock, stock price. Sell. That is my rationale. That is my rating. Sell. That's my target. I could also say, you know what? I think Anheuser-Busch InBev could actually grow even faster because they're well positioned in the emerging markets in the next five years. I also think that even though their EBITDA won't change, they'll stay at around 40%, which is the best they've ever done other than this weird 2013 year. So they'll stay high. And that actually gets me to a share price of 130. I'm a buy. So if they get to 12% growth a year versus 8% growth a year, I'm now in the buy range. Right? And both of those could be right. Because I don't know what the future is. But you have to tell me why you said 12%. You can't just put in 12%. You got to tell me why you said 6%. You can't just put in 6%. You got to give a rationale. If you change the margins, change the tax rates, change the G, why are you changing it? Right? That's what you got to put as part of your homework assignments. Questions? <clears throat> so, week from today, for Heineken, you're going to use this model for Heineken that you've just completed. Right? Because I'm not going to post any of this. Right? Because if I give you this model that I just created in class, you'll have no idea how the model works. The only way you will truly know how it works is if you individually create it. So you've been following on class. I record this as a video. You have to finish up the model yourself and get to this point in the model. Okay? For ABI InBev. And try and get to this exact point. So how do I reuse the model? So I'm going to save this. Okay? So where the reusable model is primarily based is on the model data tab. So this model data tab is where all the data is coming from in Bloomberg. Now what's very important is it's got to come from Bloomberg, those fields in this order, because our model assumes that revenue will always be on row six and cost of revenue will always be on row seven. So if it's not in that right order, it's going to cause problems when you try and reuse this. Okay, so here's the next step for your assignments. Where this comes from is in the FA, Historical Financial Information, custom, you will have to create a custom template which has those 80 pieces of data okay, in that order. That's the first step. So here's the nice thing. In the model, column B, are the actual Bloomberg database field names. Column A is the friendly name. Bloomberg will change that friendly name from company to company. Why? I don't know, but they do. But column B doesn't change, right? Because column B is the actual name of the database field. So here's the easiest way to do it. I need the first data output to be sales rev turn. Copy. I go to Bloomberg. Enter field. I have an option. I could do sales underscore rev underscore turn, and that's revenue. And I could verify that by hovering over that. Or cost of revenue, copy, paste, select. So if I feel like manually typing everything and I'm very fast, I can type it in. If I'm lazy, then I just copy row column B from Excel into Bloomberg, but I'm going to have to do that another 77 times or whatever it is. But it's very important you do it in that order and you create that template. Also very important, in your settings, number of periods, six. The model uses six historical years. Bloomberg defaults to 10. If you export 10 historical years, you're putting a square peg in the round hole, you'll break the model. So you need to make sure it's six historical years, right? Also, data. You don't want to have any of these other things checked. You only want the data for those six years exported. No frivolous information. For display, make sure the display order is ascending. You want the most current year on the right, not on the left, okay? Because we build from left to right in this model. And under Excel, 
make sure export as value. Because if you export as formulas, then it'll give you something called a BDP lookup, which means every time you open the model, it'll look to Bloomberg to pull down the data in real time, which is really cool until you leave the lab. Because the second you leave the lab, your model will error out. And when you submit it to the TAs, they're just going to see errors in your model. They won't see any numbers. And that'll cause problems mm -hmm. for your grade. So export data, which means send me numbers. So if I leave the lab, I actually have the data. Okay, Make sure those are set into your default settings in Bloomberg. So you will have this template, which I call my template, discard this, model. So you will create and resave this reusable template, because we're going to use this a lot okay, throughout the next few weeks. And this is also what you're going to do for your group projects. So here's the deal. I switched the company to Heineken. So here's Heineken. Okay, then output Excel current template. So very quickly, what Bloomberg should do with our template is it should have dumped the data for Heineken here into our model. One other thing I want to let you know about. See these dashes? Excel chokes on dashes in formulas. You can't have any dashes in our model. So when Bloomberg doesn't have a data point, instead of putting zeros, they put dashes. I don't know why they don't just give us zeros, but they give us dashes. So, simplest thing to do. Find, so copy, find the dashes, replace with zeros, replace all the dashes with zeros. There will be 43 placements you'll make for Heineken. If you don't replace the dashes with zeros, when you put it into our model, you'll get errors in cells. So that's just something you'll always have to do. I don't know how to get around that in Bloomberg, because Bloomberg doesn't export zeros. Don't know why. So save this somewhere. So I will call this my downloads Heineken data. OK? Now. So I have my Heineken data. So I go back to my Excel model for ABI InBev. Okay, so I'll do file, save as, I'll rename the model. Instead of ABI, I'll call this HEIN, as is. So very important. I take the file that I've just downloaded for Heineken. I select the entire tab, right click copy. I take go to the ABI model data, right click the whole tab, paste special values. Because I only want to put the numbers in. I don't want to put like references or anything else. And so when I overwrite the whole tab, then this has now been replaced with Heineken's data and it should flow through the model. Okay. However, to finish, I will need to go to the assumptions. I'll need to get Heineken's WAC and overwrite that. I will need to do a Heineken G. I will need to do a Heineken EEO for sales and revenue. I will need to do a Heineken multiples for EV to sales and EV to EBIT. I will then have to come to ratios and a Heineken current share price. Right. I'll need to come to a Heineken tax rate. I will need a Heineken EBITDA margin in the future. And I'll need a Heineken growth rate. Okay, So going through the process, because what you've left in for the previous company, in this case ABI InBev, is still there. right? Mm -hmm. So if you don't change the 2 billion shares outstanding, it's going to have the wrong share count for Heineken. Because Heineken's WAC is not 7%. It is 7.8%. Okay, so you're going to make sure you put in Heineken's WAC. Heineken's share count is not 2 billion. Correct? I don't know what Heineken's share count is. Ticker change. Heineken NA. <coughs> is 576 million. Okay, so make sure that you put in 
576.0 as opposed to 2 billion 18 or whatever it is for ABI. Otherwise, you'll just get this crazy share price and you'll spin your wheels wondering what the hell just happened, right? Or Heineken's EBITDA margin may be different. You probably know because you did the estimated margins on the multiples. May be different than ABI index. So make sure you put in there EBITDA margins, okay? So as I said, that's what you need to do for the as is. Then you do a final and then you do a write up in Word explaining what you did for the as is assumptions, what you did for the uh, final assumptions. That's due one week from today. Okay? So I'm giving you class time on Wednesday. So Wednesday I'm going to call Bloomberg Lab Day because you have to use the terminals and you won't have time. So, and you got a week to do it, right? But in the next week, here's what you got to do, just as a reminder. Number one, you got to go to the FA section. You got to create the model export, and you got to make sure that you have the exportable six-year model, okay? Because we're going to use that pretty heavily over the next month and a half. So again, when you do this, you'll quickly find <coughs> that reusing this model to do another company takes 10 minutes, okay? So building the first model, two hours. Building model number two, 10 minutes, All right? If you actually have a Bloomberg terminal, you can automate it. So literally, you just type in a ticker, and it's done instantaneously. But you don't have take-home Bloomberg terminals. So you will have to copy and paste data from the lab, 10 minutes, okay? So again, you'll need to then basically finish up the model so you can do this. You have to finish up ABI and then <coughs> create Heineken, right? and then create their as-is and create their targets. That's due 10 a.m. next Monday for all sections. In addition, team, the next team on the list, you're also doing AMBEV. So individually, you're doing ABI InBev, but as a team, you're going to do AMBEV. Okay? So you're going to walk us through your assumptions for AMBEV. So here's the nice thing is next Monday, we'll have three models for three companies, the top three beer companies in the world. We'll have ABI, we'll have AMBEV, and we'll have Heineken. And then we can talk through the three valuations. Right? So you'll do as is target for Heineken. And then the other team will do as is target for AMBEV. We won't do Bull and Bear. We'll cover Bull and Bear next week. And we'll cover doing a more realistic G next week. So here you can try and do a G, but basically we'll cover the Gs next week. Questions about any of this? Yes? Word document. So you'll turn in three files. You'll turn in two Excel files, one as is, the other um, target, and the third will be a Word document with just your explanations. And like I said, with the explanations, I'm concerned about four things. So you don't have to give me the process, meaning I went to Bloomberg, I got the DES screen, I put in the share count. That I know you did. What I want to hear is, why'd you put the revenue growth rate that you did? Why'd you put the EBITDA margin that you did? Why'd you use the tax rate that you did? Why'd you use the G that you did? Times two. Why'd you use it for the as is? Why did you change it if you did in the final model for the target valuation? And again, it's perfectly acceptable to use real world data, meaning I changed it because I agreed with an analyst. I read their report. I, you know, I looked at the Bico screen. I looked at the Bloomberg intelligence for the industry. I looked at the industry growth rates and I thought, this is a little high versus what the what I had to use in the as is. And so I used what I thought was a more realistic growth rate for the industry. Or I use the IBIS World Report. So this is what I mean by don't just plug and chuck. Because you can make this a very quick exercise to basically just optimize a model to get a share price. And that's important to do, but I it's more important to me to understand why did you use the assumptions you use as opposed to just plugging the model to get to the share price. That's the difference between a good analyst and a mediocre analyst, by the way. And we're going to practice that a lot over the next month. So again, for the last month of class, every class, different company. We're going to keep practicing this constantly over time. And to me, this is also, <clears throat> I will say, the end to some degree of the content, meaning you now know enough content-wise to be able to do this. The rest of the semester, real-world application. So to me, this is kind of the more interesting part of the semester because we're out of the book now, and we're definitely going to start solving real-world company problems. So questions about any of this? So no class, no lecture on Monday, Wednesday. I'm giving you class time to finish this, all this assignment. It's a big assignment, and you will need to use the terminals to do this. And you'll need to use Excel. So everybody, one week today on Monday. Have a good weekend. One second.